Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. It's common to have books that compile all the promises of God. The funny thing is they rarely include God's promises in Genesis 15. And yet this passage gives us some of the most important promises in the entire Bible. We're going to see that while they were first given to Abraham, they ultimately include anyone who will call upon the Lord to be their God and Savior and King. So welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. My name is Russ Brewer. I am pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And today we are studying Genesis 15 and God's promises to Abraham. Now, as we turn to Genesis 15, the year is something like 2081 BC. Genesis 15 is now 10 years after God's first promises to Abraham in Genesis 12. And so once again, God comes to Abraham to make a promise to him. And this is his fourth interaction with Abraham that we have recorded in the scriptures. And verse 1 starts with the words, after these things. And that's referring to what we looked at yesterday in Genesis 14, when Abraham rescued his nephew from the hands of King Keterlaomer. You might remember that after Abraham returned, he met with King Melchizedek. He gave Melchizedek a tithe. Melchizedek gave a blessing upon Abraham. And so the phrase after these things is saying after all of these events of chapter 14. And so going on to verse 1 here, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Now, Genesis 14 doesn't seem to show us that Abraham is super afraid of anyone. And yet the Lord reminds Abram that he is Abram's protector, and he has been with Abraham and will protect him and will reward Abraham immensely. And this just reminds us that there is truly a righteous reward for those who pursue the Lord and do his work in this world. Just thinking about Paul's own example, he says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, he says, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so Paul is just looking forward to that day of reward. And here we're seeing God promise to Abraham or Abram, he will reward him too for his faithfulness. And so here in Genesis 15, the Lord assures Abram that he will be rewarded for his obedience to the will and the work of God. And God's promises sound great. There's just one small problem. No kiddos. Ten years have passed since the Lord first told Abram he'd be a great nation and he still doesn't have any kids. Abraham's 85 years old. His wife is 75 years old. It was going to be tough enough to swing things when she was 65. And now she's 75. And Abraham knows enough of how things work to know that there's no earthly way that he and Sarah are going to have any kids. And so in verses 2 and 3, Abram says, O Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. And so Abraham's thinking back to the promises that God has already made him 10 years ago He's now 85 years old. He can kill over any day now. At this point, he's not even buying green bananas. And so if he kills over, everything he has is going to go to Eleazar, not to some descendant. And so the Lord says to him in verse 4, This man, speaking of Eleazar, will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And so this promise of descendants here is not going to be through some man-made contrivance. It's going to be fulfilled through Abraham's actual son. And so the miracle is not that Abram would have a son at his age. The miracle is that Sarah or Sarai would have a child at her age. And the Lord is going to wait long enough to be clear that this miracle is from his hand. And so in verse 5, the Lord takes Abram outside and has him look up at the stars and says to him, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now, notice that word descendant in verse 5. Your translation may say offspring, but that's really the word for seed. And and that's going to become very important as we try to unpack who this promise applies to. We're going to see that more clearly as we look at Genesis 22. But before we get to that, let's go into verse 6. Verse 6 is key because it is a model of salvation for all people. Verse 6 says, Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, this passage is quoted in several places in the New Testament to show us that a person is not saved by their works, as in, we can't do enough good works to deserve a place in heaven. No one is good enough to do that. And so instead, God offers us salvation by grace through faith, and that's modeled here by Abraham. And so faith is critical here. The thing is, what did Abraham believe? Well, in verse 1, the Lord promised to be a shield to Abraham, and Abraham believed him. In verse 4, the Lord promised Abraham a son, and Abraham believed him. In verse 5, the Lord promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars, and Abraham believed him. 
Then in verse 7, the Lord promised Abraham this land, and Abraham believed him. Abraham lived a life of faith. And not only that, he lived out his faith. For instance, back in Genesis 12, the Lord told Abraham to leave Haran, and Abraham believed God and left and came to the promised land. Abraham was living his life in light of God's promises. And so faith is not some wispy hope. It's a reliance upon God where we live in light of what God has said. And so we see in Abraham the pattern of faith for all of us. To have Abraham's faith, we are to hear the word of God, accept it at face value, and then live our lives in light of it. And just as with Abraham, when we believe God and his word, he counts us as righteous. Well, going on to verse 7, verse 7 says, And he, that would be the Lord, said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He, Abram, said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? And so as an answer to this question, the Lord then makes a solemn covenant with Abraham. Now, we've talked about covenants already in previous podcasts. A covenant is a binding agreement that two people make to one another based on promises. It's not a contract because a contract is meant to hold the other person to their word. A covenant is about the promises that we make to them, not what they make to us. And so a covenant is rooted in a relationship, in goodwill, and in trust. And the most common covenant in our day is that of a marriage covenant, where each person makes promises to one another to love and honor and cherish each other until death do them part. And so here, as stunning as it is, God is making a covenant with Abraham, and like a wedding, God then holds this ceremony with Abraham to show him the certainty of these promises. And while this ceremony is not what we might do today, we can see the point of it as we work through these verses. And as we look at this passage, notice that God doesn't have to tell Abram what to do with every step of the way. And why is that? Well, because God was using a ceremony that Abram understood because he had seen things like this before with covenants between people. And so verse 9 says, So he, the Lord, said to him, Abram, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. These would be animals used in the ceremonial process. And, and verse 10 says, Then he brought all of these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, and he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. And so you've got this ceremony going on. And in verse 12, it's getting dark, and Abram falls asleep. And we're going to see in a moment that this is part of the plan. Abram's asleep because he's not making promises to God. God is making these promises to Abraham. And one of the promises of God comes in the form of a prophecy in verse 13. Verses 13 and 14 says, God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. God is so committed to the fact that Abram is going to have a multitude of descendants that here the Lord even tells him that not only is this a certainty, they're going to be enslaved for 400 years. Now, we of course know that God is speaking of their time in Egypt after Jacob and his sons enter into Egypt with a famine. But we're going to see, though, that this is fulfilled in a couple of weeks when we get to Exodus chapter 12. Now, for what it's worth, the Exodus passage says it was going to be 430 years, yet here is 400 years. But that difference in time is readily understood when we realize it took about 30 years after the children of Israel entered Egypt before they were enslaved. And yet, even in all of this, the Lord still tells Abraham here in verse 16 that eventually his people will return to the promised land in fulfillment of these promises. Now, going back to this ceremony here, let's drop to verse 17, which says, It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. And so Abraham sees this flaming torch pass between these animal pieces. And while that may not make sense to us, again, the Lord was adopting patterns of covenants that would have been familiar and even convincing to Abraham. In their day, when two people made a covenant with each other, they'd cut animals in half and the people would walk between them as a picture of what would happen to them if they violated these principles. Now, again, that's how it's supposed to go. But notice here, Abram never walked between these animal pieces. Why is that? Well, that's because the Abrahamic covenant is not about the covenantal promises that Abraham makes to God but the promises that 